Halifax, Nova Scotia has been a prominent seaport since 1750. Over the years, two million immigrants rejoiced when they reached her shores. But not every landing here would be a cause for celebration. When the RMS Titanic went down 600 miles from here, 1,500 passengers were left drifting in the salty water. As the 700 who were rescued sailed on to New York, the bodies of those left behind were hauled out of the disaster site and eventually landed in Halifax. The dignified manner in which Halifax dealt with the victims would forever cement its place in the history of the Titanic disaster. joining us. We've been blessed with a beautiful April night. If you're from Nova Scotia, you know it could snow. It could snow. The Titanic 100 Society and its sponsors have produced this show to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. As Halibillians and Nova Scotians, a hundred years ago, when tragedy called, we answered. The role that Nova Scotia played in this tragic event. This is a true testimony of our nature and our heritage. And I want to thank you because we are proud Nova Scotians. Halifax has always been a port city, right from its inception till today. Most people, if their families were living in, in Halifax prior to 1950, got here by boat. Until there was air travel, it was ship travel. A lot of boats and people didn't make the journey through shipwrecks a lot of the time. So there is that relationship that people in Halifax have to the, to the sea. You know, anybody can look out the window and, and see the ocean and see the ships coming in every day. It sort of hits home when you think that maybe one of those ships won't make it in the next time. there's hairbrushes out there or um, jewelry that's for sale we're not interested in that unless you know it's a Halifax connection most of the artifacts that we have in our collection are artifacts that were donated uh, and most of them were floating and picked up at the time of the wreck and that's what we're interested in the stuff that was picked up off Newfoundland by the cable ships brought into Halifax and that's what we're interested in and that's what we want to tell that's the story that we want to tell it's the Halifax connection Titanic was born with the, the struggle to find it. It was the holy grail for oceanographers to map the ocean floor and find that lump on the bottom. My main interest came in the 1970s when my former boss, uh, Phyllis Blakely, asked me, um, she had had a request for someone to talk to school children about the Titanic. And um, she asked me to do it. And so I said, well, I'd really like to do it and, and give it a lot of Halifax flavor. And so that's when I sat down and started reading the newspapers and then discovered that George Wright had been on board the ship and lost his life and that Hilda Slater had been on board the ship and had been saved. And she was on her way back on the Titanic with her trousseau. She was coming home to get married and was going to get married in British Columbia. 
she was probably very fortunate to get, she was a second class passenger, she was close to the upper deck, she got up to the upper deck and was put into a lifeboat. She knew most of the same people that George knew, so she knew George Wright as well. I don't think I thought much about my ancestry until like that experience happened because it is such a, a major event, uh, especially for people in Halifax, and to have someone related to me who went through that definitely broadened my horizons. It's an overwhelming feeling, this loss of, of life. There's so many stories, so many lives that are affected, and some of the stories never get told, and these people are lost to history. And the ships are remembered, but the people are forgotten. I started doing some genealogy research, and as I was looking through the books, there's these photographs of people, and you start to think, what happened to these people? This is only one moment in, in their life. And it really hit home when I realized that one of the photographs was actually my grandfather when he was 10 months old on the rescue ship. If you really start putting yourself in, in these people's shoes, you can, you can feel it. They're leaving everything that they've known behind. They're leaving family and friends. They're going off into the great unknown and it was dangerous. You didn't know where you were going. You didn't know if even you were going to make it. And when you got at your destination, you didn't know if it was going to be the great promised land that you've heard everything about. My great-grandmother had two small children. One was three years old and my grandfather being 10 months old. They were scheduled to travel on the Titanic. And due to reasons lost to history, they took about a year later. They came across on the liner Volturno in October of 1913. The boat didn't quite make it. It caught fire and sank in the middle of the Atlantic. My grandfather and great-grandmother got into a lifeboat and my grandfather's sister put her arms around a sailor's neck and they actually had to dive into the water. And as they got into the water, very heavy seas and the ship actually pitched and rolled on top of them as they were swimming to the boat the rescue ship, and the force of the boat rolling actually killed her. I, I can't even imagine um, what was going through my uh, great-grandmother's mind when she was seeing this happen. She, she saw her, her daughter sinking in, into the ocean in front of her eyes. The thing about that late part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, there were a lot of wrecks. Ships tended to bump into each other all the time tended to go on shoals. A lot of them were lost and never heard about. With more than 10,000 ships wrecked off her shores, Nova Scotia is no stranger to the cruelty of the sea. As a child, Samuel Kennard witnessed a shipwreck in his hometown of Halifax. As he ran to the water's edge, he stood powerless to help and listened in horror to the cries of the dying. Haunted all his life by the tragedy, Kennard dreamed of a day when ocean travel would be as safe and dependable as travel by train. In 1839, Kennard launched an ocean liner company, which would grow to become the safest and most successful steamship line in history. To this day, the Cunard Line is known for having never lost a single passenger in a shipwreck. The Cunard people would not take Noah himself as a first mate till they had worked him through all the lower grades and tried him for 10 years. Mark Twain. In 1912, White Star Line was intent on one thing above all else enticing upper-class customers with the promise of spectacular extravagance. As early as 1854, greed had tarnished White Star's reputation. When RMS Tallur, the largest merchant vessel of her day, sunk in the Irish Sea on her maiden voyage, the inquest placed the blame firmly on White Star. In 1873, another White Star vessel went down near Halifax. The RMS Atlantic has become known by many as the first Titanic. You go to our website, we have a whole thing on shipwrecks. One section of it, it deals exclusively with the Atlantic. It was the worst ship disaster until the Titanic occurred. Problems with 
them being in the wrong place at the wrong time, not talking proper soundings. Over 600 people were killed. As always, Nova Scotians were there to lend a hand in a time of need. In 1917, two ships collided in Halifax Harbor, the Emo and the Mont Blanc, causing a 2.9 kiloton blast, which to this day is the largest unintentional man-made explosion in history. Now, the Emo was the Belgian relief ship, but the Emo used to be a White Star ship. It was a White Star cattle boat, Runic. So three of the greatest disasters that have ever befallen Halifax are all connected with the White Star Line. The Atlantic, the Titanic, and the Halifax explosion. There was one true hero in the Titanic story. Arthur Henry Rostron, captain of the Cunard ship RMS Carpathia, quickly became engrossed in the rescue mission. He ordered his crew to stoke the boilers to achieve maximum speed, posted extra lookouts, and painstakingly navigated to avoid icebergs. As a result, the Carpathia picked up each of the freezing survivors and brought them safely to New York. Rostron meticulously attended to every detail. His training as a Cunard captain had truly paid off. Rostron was made Commodore of the Cunard Line and was eventually knighted. Obviously, White Star, you can only imagine the panic that they must have felt. Of course, as time went on, they probably had a very good idea that they weren't picking up passengers so much they were going to be picking up bodies. So they had to hire ships. Where was the closest place to get the ships? It was Halifax. They chose the Mackie Bennett. They immediately started to unload cargo they had and started to load coffins. The crew were not obligated to go out. They were offered double pay. Pretty much all of them went. And I don't think they went because they were getting double pay and they were like, you know, hooray, let's go out and make some quick dollars. They wanted to go, they wanted to help. They wanted to do whatever they could do. So they, they went out and they went out on the ship knowing that it was not gonna be pretty. And some of the letters that exist from the crew members tells about the horrific things that they had to see when they were out there. It was their human nature to help to be there, to continue to do this job and to see it through. Certainly, I'm sure, stayed with them for many, many years. It really left a mark on their lives. They never anticipated recovering 328 bodies. When Mackie Bennett went out, it took a journal with it. The first body was noted on page one, the second body on page two. Any bodies that they thought could not be brought back to Halifax in good shape would be buried at sea. None of us know how they were affected. By pulling a body out of the water, of course weighing a great deal because of water soap, with their life jacket on, and pulling them on board the ship, and then turning them over and perhaps half their face being gone. Mackie Bennett became known as the death ship because it came in the harbor with coffins and dead bodies. It took a long time to get rid of that nickname that it had and probably, you know, not obviously a very happy nickname. When the Mackie Bennett came to the harbor mouth, all of the public buildings, their flags were put at half mast, And the churches, the one closest to the harbor mouth, started peeling. And all of the churches in Halifax then started to peel their bells. And as the Mackie Bennett came up the harbor, the bells continued to ring until the ship moored. There are little bits of Titanic uh, memorabilia around. Snow's uh, funeral home was on Argyle Street in what is today the Five Fishermen Restaurant. These are tracks that were used to move coffins made for the Titanic victims. Many of these bodies had not been completely embalmed. Any identified bodies went to Snow's. Any unidentified bodies went to the Mayflower Curling Club, which is the location today of Army and Navy surplus store in the Grigler Street. Uh, yes, as we found out from a tourist who showed up once here, uh, they came like with a tour book, and they asked us if this was the location of the of some curling rink back in the like, teens. We knew that it was, so we thought, yeah, 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 it is. But they said that it was used as the morgue for the Titanic because it was basically the only refrigerated building in Halifax that was large enough for it. So yeah, that's how I found out that the store has a connection to Titanic and just someone walking in off the streets with a book. 
It was about 10 years ago that Gary Schutlick and I went up to the YMCA and up the front door and asked if we could see the, the George Wright plaque, because we knew there'd been a plaque. And we got just total blank stares. They didn't know who George Wright was, had no idea. In the early days, of course, everybody talked about the ship and the crew and all of the first-class passengers because they were rich and famous. John Jacob Astor being the richest man in the world, Benjamin Guggenheim probably being the second or third richest man in the world. With all of the first-class passengers on board Titanic from the United States who died, the 10% of the entire wealth of the United States of America changed hands on that day. Michel Navratil was on the outs with his wife. They weren't really living together. He went over and picked up the children for a weekend visit, and he kidnapped his children. He piled them on a train in Marseille, took them up to Cherbourg, and loaded them on the Titanic, and he was off to America to start a new life with his two boys. Some say he kidnapped his children because his wife was having an affair with his business partner. Other people say he kidnapped his children because he couldn't stand his mother-in-law. He traveled under an assumed name, Hoffman, and he actually had a small revolver with him, which he still had when his body was recovered. So maybe he was expecting to encounter some problems. But he did the right thing with his two children. At the last moment, he took the two boys up to a lifeboat, and in they went. He stayed on board and lost his life. He was buried in the Jewish cemetery because of the name Hoffman. And only by the time they put the names on the graves did they know that he was, in fact, an Avertil. The mother saw the two children in a newspaper article that was published in France. She was required to come to America to identify the children. She was put on board the Oceanic, which is also a White Star ship, but the children recognized their mama, no doubt at all that, that this was a family, and she went back on the same Oceanic. Mr. Navratil, the son, came and visited in about 1996. He was taken to the Jewish cemetery, put his hand on the top of his father's grave, and said he could hear the angels singing. When Cameron's big movie on the Titanic came out, we had a very small exhibit here at the museum. We had no idea of the magnitude the movie would bring and the popularity. So Cameron's movie came out and he happened to pick somebody who happened to have the name Dawson. Then, you, of course, you have all these young people coming in. I don't know if you've ever been there in the summertime, but you'll often find flowers at Jay Dawson's headstone, although Joseph Dawson is not the Dawson on board Titanic. The unknown child's shoes that you find in the Titanic exhibit here is by far the most popular artifact that we have on display. These shoes hit the heart of the people on the cable ship, so they paid themselves, pulled their money together, and bought a headstone for this child. This here headstone here was of the unknown child. He was a fourth victim to be recovered. And as you can see, people leave little trinkets and little ornaments in the honor of this little child. This child was said to be the Poulsen's youngest child, Costa Leonard, because her husband was waiting in Chicago for her arrival. And because of the description and everything of the child, he said that this was his, his youngest son. When they buried Alma Paulson, they buried her right as close as they could put her to body number four in the, the outer row. She had in her pocket, she had tickets for herself and four children, the youngest of which was Gusta Leonard Paulson, two years old. And the, the people at the time in 1912 actually wrote Paulson Baby question mark. In the late 90s, DNA testing was used in an attempt to solve the mystery of the unknown child. With the help of a forensic investigator from the FBI, his identity was determined in 2008. With the unknown child, because of there being a breastplate on the child's uh, uh, chest, uh, they were able to find a bone. And also they found a couple of teeth. By early 2002, we knew we did not have any match. We had extracted mitochondrial DNA from a piece of bone. It was a very difficult thing to do because the bone had degraded quite badly and it, there was other crystals and mineral in it. But we also had realized that one of the teeth, because it's surrounded with enamel, the dentin in the middle of the tooth had survived very well. And that dentin gave us a very good mitochondrial DNA signal. They also had the expertise of a dental forensic scientist. They then finally were able to identify the child as Sidney Goodwin. William, Frederick, Charles, Lillian, Augusta, Jesse, Harold, and Sidney T. Goodwin all perished in 1912. 
Ninety-six years later, their relatives traveled to Halifax for a memorial service. They decided not to put Sidney Goodwin's name on the gravestone. They felt the marker had come to represent all of the children who lost their short lives on the Titanic. Hilda and George both ended up in the Titanic, not because they knew each other, but they represented, in the case of George, obviously the elite that was on board the ship. Hilda was somewhere in second class and perhaps not a member of the elite, but certainly marrying into a, a family that had some aspirations. George was born in Dartmouth uh, in what we now call Burnside Industrial Park. They have a street named after him, Wright Avenue. He now would probably be called a millionaire, but we don't know the value in 1912. The reason he got wealthy is that he realized that as the British Empire expanded, businessmen were going to need to know, who do I contact in Australia? Who do I contact if I want to sell my wares? So he developed a series of business directories. And there's one survives over in the museum in Dartmouth. It's 4,000 pages. It's huge. You can't imagine carrying it with you on your business trip. But if you were wanting to know, who do I send my brochure to? Who do I send my salesman to? George Wright's directories were very, very important. He had built a number of very significant buildings in Halifax. He wasn't building high-rises, but he built two four-story buildings down on Barrington Street. And then the other is the development that he built, which has very prominent houses for wealthier people on one side, and then in behind would be the working class, but it was an integrated development, the kind of integrated development we are still advocating we build more of. And then his own house at the corner of Inglis and Young Avenue. There are several tenants in the building, and I guess you want me to say I'm one of them. I live in the attic of the building. What I have as my living quarters is what would have been George Wright's billiard and trophy room. He used J.C. Demerick as his architect, and Demerick was his architect for all of his buildings, including the two office buildings he built downtown, one called the Wright Marble Building and the second called the St. Paul Building. His brother put up a memorial stone to his memory in Christchurch Cemetery in Dartmouth, which doesn't normally get many tours because it's inconvenient to go all the way over to Dartmouth. On the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, a fashion show featuring clothing of the period paid tribute to Titanic passengers, including Hilda Slater. She boarded one of the last lifeboats, and it was one of the only lifeboats to be filled to capacity with a full complement of 65 on board. She did marry Captain Lacan, and they had a son. She lived in BC until 1964 when she moved back to Halifax. Rosalie has put all the crystal rhinestones on it, all 3,000 of them. Doesn't she look lovely? Hilda Slater, in her later life, uh, before she died in 1965, started to put together her memoirs. It's interesting to compare what she says about the boat and what happened on the boat to what Lawrence Beasley said. They are the same. Whether she'd read Lawrence Beasley's book or not, we'll never know. She had a very fascinating life, uh, even though she was basically a middle-class girl from Halifax. She talks about being in Halifax as a child, being in France, um, when her brother went to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. She talks about being in Italy. She talks about being in England. As far as I know, she was coming from England and she was studying music in Italy, which didn't pan out for her as well as I think she had hoped. And uh, she was coming back to get married. One of the interesting things is that her belongings, her wedding dress sunk with the Titanic. Her brother, who was a naval officer at various times, seems to have been seconded to the Royal Yacht. So Hilda is at the Isle of Wight having dinner with King Edward VII and the German Kaiser. So she traveled, even though she was a nice little Halifax girl whose father was a medical doctor, when you read her memoirs, they're quite fascinating. And she did quite an extensive bit on being on board the Titanic. She actually enjoyed the solitude of walking on the deck as the ship was sinking. Maybe she really didn't want to get married. <laughs> she didn't seem to be in any hurry to leave at all and basically ended up being in a lifeboat because she was practically picked up by a member of the crew and thrown in it. The first organized tours of Titanic aficionados were as early as 1981. That's when Jack Eaton and Charlie Haas came up the next year, did a whole issue of the Titanic Commutator on Halifax. The word was beginning to get out that we have 150 graves here. There's also material to look at. You actually have family members who, if they know they have family members here, 
when they come to Halifax, will try to go to the graveyard to show their interest in their ancestors and, and to give closure to these families after all those years. Hilda left Halifax uh, with her mother uh, permanently in 1907-08. When she came to be buried, she chose to be buried back here in Halifax. Her brother Charles, who lived in New York for years, went to England to live for a while, and again, when he died, his body was brought back to Halifax for burial, which I find is very, very interesting to think that so many members of this family would return to Halifax for burial, even though they spent most of their adult lives in other parts of the world. Halifax is a, a great place to live. Like, this is where I would want to be buried. Uh, yeah. Nova Scotians are very welcoming, proud, and compassionate in times of distress and tragedy. In recent history, Nova Scotians have lent a hand in the Swiss air disaster, in Hurricane Juan, and of course, the days after 9-11. Look at any kind of disaster that happens, and, and Nova Scotians, I think, are the first people that are there that are willing to help, reaching in their pocket to give money or help rebuild or do whatever. I think it's the, it's the maritime way, really. I, th I think Haligonians, Maritimers, we're, we're there. We're, we're going to help. We're going to do whatever we can do. I'll take 